Okay, excellent. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this webinar on masterclasses for open digital cultural heritage. My name is Giovanni Colavizza and I'm an assistant professor uh, of digital humanities at the University of Amsterdam. And I'm, I'm very excited and very happy uh, to have uh, an amazing lineup of speakers today uh, with us uh, for, this, for this session. So without further ado, and sorry for the little wait at the beginning, this is the program that we have uh, prepared for you today. We will start with uh, a short introduction and welcome addresses, and then we will have three exciting presentations from, uh, from our speakers uh, on a variety of topics that I'll, I'll come back to in a, in a moment. This will cover the first, uh, the first hour, then we will have a break. Um, and then during the second part of the session, we will have ample time for questions and a panel discussion with a Q&A. So I um, encourage you to, uh, to really think about questions and things that you want to ask to our speakers uh, and uh, keep them there because we won't do that after each presentation, but uh, during the second part of the session. Um, again, the webinar will be recorded, but importantly, it will also be uh, uploaded online and uh, all those of you that have been uh, registering via Eventbrite will receive the link there and also via Twitter, we will, of course, share it. Um, and again, yeah, questions during the second, the second part. All right, then, uh, before I take the word uh, again, I'd like to uh, please ask um, uh, for welcome addresses to uh, Professor uh, Julia Norderhaf, Professor of Digital Heritage at the University of Amsterdam, and also the head of uh, the Creative Amsterdam Program and Laboratory at the same university uh, for the first welcome address. Uh, Julia, please. Thank you very much, Giovanni, also for organizing uh, this session which is a, a joint a collaboration uh, between the CREATE a program and lab and uh, European research. Um, and it's fabulous uh, that this series of uh, workshops will take place. And um, I, I'm very grateful to European research for uh, their patience in organizing these workshops, which really should be uh, done on site. Um, and uh, to, yeah, to uh, co-organize with us this uh, online session to introduce those workshops to you with these wonderful uh, speakers and, um, and hosts. So the, uh, at the University of Amsterdam, we have this Creative Amsterdam uh, project where we, or program, research program, where we study the history of urban creativity with uh, digital sources and digital methods. And the efforts, of, by now we also have a lab that offers uh, researchers support in working with digital data and tools. And uh, in our research program, we focus not only on uh, historical research uh, based on these digital methods, but also on reflecting on these digital methods uh, specifically for historical data and tools, um, because obviously that brings uh, new challenges uh, as well as uh, alongside the new opportunities. Um, I already said we uh, offer research support services and scholars from uh, history, media studies, uh, musicology, theater studies, um, a wide variety of disciplines uh, work together with our programmers and staff to um, get exciting new results based on these opportunities of the vast sets of data that are of course also made available in infrastructures such as Europeana. So it's a really great, and I, and I know that Europeana research uh, uh, shares the same ambition of making these cultural heritage data, the big data of the past, accessible uh, for anyone, and also in particular for research purposes. So it's my great pleasure and honor to co-host this seminar today, and I wish you a wonderful session. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, and uh, to everyone uh, in the room. If you'd like to know more about uh, CREATE, please visit the website and uh, also uh, enroll to the register to the newsletter. We always have exciting initiatives uh, going on. Next, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Alba Iolo, the research coordinator in charge of Europeana Research, uh, for a welcome address. And of course, uh, I join Julia in thanking Europeana not only for co-organizing uh, this webinar, but for supporting the whole initiative. Thank you, Giovanni. It is my pleasure to welcome all the participants in this webinar on behalf of Europeana. And I also welcome the speakers and thank them for accepting our invitation. They will know expertise in digital scholarship across the humanities fields and the cultural heritage sector is crucial to the project of master classes for open digital cultural heritage that is being presented today. We at Europeana are very pleased to support this project and contribute to its development within the European research activities as the project is fully aligned with the European research mission. It is to facilitate cross-sectoral collaborations with a focus on digital cultural heritage. The project originates from an idea of Giovanni Colavizza in response to a call for proposal launched within the European Research Grants Programme in September 2019. That call for proposal inaugurated the new format of the programme that supports events such as conferences, workshops, training activities that can bring together cultural heritage professionals and researchers. The European Research Advisory Board members and myself were impressed by the quality of the project of three master classes to carry out in collaboration with the University of Amsterdam. We planned to run the master classes in the first semester of 2020, but due to the pandemic, in person events became the least feasible of all possible activities. This is why we decided to postpone the master classes to 2022. To Giovanni, Praise where praise is due, he has been tenacious and flexible. He has never lost his motivation. I wish you all a productive meeting and hope to see many of you participating in the master classes next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alba, for your kind words. And of course, I, I share much of that uh, to, with, with, uh, with our speakers today that have been super flexible and eager to, to keep being involved with us. Uh, and will be also in the future. So let me uh, very briefly the idea in a master class. Um, and uh, the idea really came from the realization that uh, that it is very important to share uh, to share experiences to brainstorm together across projects. Uh, in particular, we call uh, we discuss about uh, digital data and digital heritage. But it is not, uh, unfortunately, very easy to do so. Everybody's very busy and uh, it's, it's uh, easy to, uh, to stay within our rabbit holes of specific projects. But uh, instead, this would be very, very important. Um, and so we were thinking about, uh, in particular, create how to foster those productive encounters, but also make them quite efficient, right? Because that, that is a necessity uh, of modern day life. And this is how the idea of masterclasses came to be. Uh, a masterclass is a one-day free event, so it doesn't take costs. Um, it can be open or closed, I mean, by invitation or, or more open, uh, that is focused on a specific team of choice. And it is organized as follows. There is a host, one or more, uh, usually a cultural institution that has a direct interest in the proposed team. And there is uh, one or more renowned experts uh, that really have been working uh, uh, and are um, internationally recognized in the team uh, of interest. And uh, the expert um, leads uh, a day long uh, brainstorming, a set of activities that uh, broadly follows the model of the unconference, if you're familiar with that. So it's, a, it's an on-site organization of what to discuss and how, which is very fast paced and also made uh, effective by having different teams, different groups joining together, but preparing the activities for the day. So in a nutshell, 
uh, this could be um, really, we thought that this could be a really uh, great opportunity uh, to share experiences about the project, to share challenges, and have different viewpoints, different perspectives of people that uh, still are experts on a given topic. So to try to, uh, to take it forward and to try to find solutions uh, to those challenges. Uh, and then uh, the masterclass is, uh, is, is meant to end with a public lecture from the, uh, from the experts uh, in order also to involve the, the general public, the broader public into this uh, experience. Uh, so that's the idea, and, and so again, the, the motivation I think is very important. Uh, the main one is to foster the exchange of ideas and expertise, and try to keep it very cohesive in terms of the team, so that uh, you know it's, it becomes very effective. Um, and then uh, there is another uh, goal which I think is important, uh, and that is of connecting uh, practitioners, researchers, experts with. Uh, hosting institutions, for example, cultural heritage organizations. And uh, ideally, in a masterclass, both participate. So um, professionals, um, part of, the, of an organization, and, uh, for example, researchers in academia, they join forces on a given team of choice to, to work together during this, this day. Uh, and then the idea of this proposal that we submitted to Europeana was to, to do a, a trial run of master classes, focusing on the overarching theme of open digital cultural heritage. And um, in coordination with uh, first group of uh, really amazing experts, uh, we thought of the following three uh, topics for three different master classes. Uh, the first one is citizen engaged heritage science and uh, greatly represented here today by Dr. Mia Ridge the British Library's digital curator for Western heritage collections. That is, I mean, I really don't need to introduce Mia. Uh, she has been working uh, really a lot on, uh, on crowdsourcing and engaging uh, uh, citizen science uh, and engaging uh, the broader public with heritage collections. The second topic is that of participatory education and training with digital cultural heritage. And again, we have uh, today uh, Dr. Stefania Scagliola from the University of Luxembourg. Also great experience on the topic, uh, many, many years uh, as, as a consultant as well, um, with experience with many organizations. And then uh, third uh, topic related to the broader team is that of organizing and mentoring effective multidisciplinary research groups. And and here who best then uh, Dr. James Smithis and Ariana Tula from the uh, King's Digital Lab that have been setting up uh, an amazing group um, in this respect at King's. So I'm really, really uh, excited and thankful for our experts today. And I hope these topics are of interest and they, uh, they really um, together uh, give an interesting perspective of uh, on open digital cultural heritage. Before I stop and I leave the uh, stage, of course, to our speakers, I would like to underline what Alba mentioned before. We plan these masterclasses for spring 2020. And unfortunately, we could not run them then, but the intention is to run them in spring 2022, hopefully <laughs> without uh, no more surprises from uh, uh, from uh, COVID. So you will hear uh, more about them. This is just an appetizer, if you like. And again, thank you so much to our speakers, uh, organizers, sponsors, and to you all uh, for being here today. And without further ado, uh, Mia, please. Um, well, thank you. Um, everyone for that introduction and thank you all for joining us today. Um, so I'll be talking about citizen science in GLAMS, which is galleries, libraries, archives and museums, just a shorter way of um, listing those institutions and digital humanities because increasingly my work at the British Library um, not only straddles digital scholarship but quite extensively goes into digital humanities. Um, I've tweeted a link to some of the projects I mentioned um, and just put it in the chat as well to help you follow along. So I thought I'd begin by looking at what I typically cover in a masterclass on this subject. Um, so things like defining 
the terms. And I like to do that by looking at examples um, from best practice. So looking at some of my favorite projects over the years um, and looking at the kinds of tasks that they um, present, thinking about ethics and why people choose to participate because these any project with the public is a form of relationship with the public. So it's important to think about the quality of those relationships. Um, look into some of the logistical questions, um, design questions, research design questions around designing projects. Um, if you work in a cultural heritage institution, thinking about how you'll get data into the project and how you might use it afterwards. Um, uh, kind of really core tasks that involve coordination across the whole institution. So um, projects can be quite small, but still touch on many departments. Generally, the masterclasses involve a mixture of hands-on activities and discussion um, alongside talks to help you really develop the ability to critique and analyze projects. So giving you some of the language that you might need to talk about projects, to discuss with others what you're trying to do, thinking about um, applying the key concepts that you've learned throughout, um, and finally learning where to find more specific resources. So that um, overview of what's in a masterclass in a way is an overview of what I'll talk about very quickly. So beginning with what is citizen science or what is crowdsourcing or any of the similar terms. These are really umbrella terms for different ways in which the public can participate in science. And here I'm using the romance language sense of the word or the um, Germanic language sense of the word science as knowledge, not only STEM subjects, but also arts and humanity subjects. So these processes generally involve the active participation of the public in scientific research or knowledge production. Um, and one of the key things is that it's a genuine outcome. So it's a result, the data or the results are more broadly ap applicable, not just to an institution. So they might be contributing to the sum of all knowledge. They might be helping make collections more discoverable. They might be answering um, research questions that have broader outcomes. So it's not just user generated content in the sense that you might occasionally see in things like have your say um, kinds of projects. Participation can take many different forms from data collection, which in citizen science might involve going out into the field and photographing um, wildlife in some sense. So photographing insects or birds or plants and recording those observations um, to look at the distribution of species or more commonly in my work, looking at digitized images and giving information of some kind about those digitized images. Processes can be more involved, so people might help with analysis. Um, they might discuss what they're finding in forums, in social media, um, through to co-creating projects. So really having a strong sense of involvement and agency in shaping how projects um, actually operate. So there's many different terms for this kind of work as well. It has very close alignment with things like digital volunteering, which starts to get us into traditional forms of volunteering in cultural heritage institutions, um, also citizen science, citizen history, niche sourcing, which is one of many terms that attempt to address the fact that there's not usually a crowd, um, it's usually a small group of people with a specific interest. So I tend to talk about crowdsourcing in cultural heritage, which is just a more focused view of this, these forms of digital public participation. So I define it as working with the public on tasks that contribute to a shared and significant goal related to cultural heritage collections or knowledge. And this takes place via online, collect, uh, online platforms. It's a shared significant goal in that um, the contributions that you make are part of a wider project that is somehow bigger than um, anything that we could do on our own. The results might contribute to wider research questions, or they might just simply, I say simply, um, help improve the discoverability of cultural heritage collections, whether that's tagging images, um, helping uh, people understand the scope of collections, translating material, um, linking unstructured text to structured identifiers, um, anything that can help uh, make cultural heritage collections easier to find. Um, these projects are often focused on access and engagement. So it's not just about the productivity of the project. Um, it's also about what you learn along the way and the relationships that you form along the way. And in part, that's why I've chosen this image because it's people working together on a shared goal. Their individual contributions all contribute to a wider picture. Um, 
So a really lovely example from quite early on is New York Public Library's What's on the Menu project, where they did a lot of work to process um, digitized images of menus from an extensive menu collection so that when they asked you to do a task, it was a micro task. It's a really small task. So what they've done here is software has helped isolate a line of text. To, so the arrow is actually focusing your attention on that particular line that it wants to know about. It's not saying transcribe a whole menu all at once. It's line by line. So they've pre-processed, they've done a lot of work on the back end. Um, so, and they've focused their task on two very specific things. What's the menu item and what was the cost? And it took them quite a while to get to this um, simplified version. So one reason I like this example is it's really engaging material. It was a very successful project, but it also shows um, how much work you can do computationally or in your workflow and data processes to support um, people in having a quite delightful experience at the front end. It's not just um, about asking people to come in and do homework for you. You have to put a quite a bit of work in um, as well. Here's another example from the very popular Zooniverse platform. Um, this is an example where there's a, a digital image in this case, it's from a camera trap, um, looking at the penguin population. Um, so it has some typical features of a site on the right hand side is the text that um, is on the front page that motivates you to participate. It explains why it's important, gives you a sense of what you'll be looking at, pictures of penguins, um, why, you know, why it's important, why you'd want to contribute, because in all these projects we're asking people to donate their time um, and there has to be a reason that people would donate their time. Other typical features are um, you can tag images so that you can find them again. Um, it shows you who's been active lately on the site. Um, there's a list of other projects and you can see that someone has commented um, and I think the remarkable face they're talking about is this penguin here. I, I don't know penguin facial expressions enough to know, but I think that would be the one that they're talking about. So you can see that not only um, there's a lot of supporting interactions around the task itself, where the task screen um, is about marking up and just counting, literally counting penguins. Um, again, from the penguin project, um, two of the outcomes are educational materials. So coloring sheets over on the right hand side that are designed to get school kids involved in the process. So they're learning about the different kinds of penguins and how to identify them by coloring them in, which is a lovely way of actively learning. And on the left hand side, um, this infographic neatly summarizes the processes. So they've collected data, they've processed it in some way. Um, there's an analysis process. So they're looking at um, questions specific to the ecology of this particular environment, they're interpreting it and then they're sharing the results. So they're actually making policy interventions as a result of their work. Um, when you see a screen of a crowdsourcing project, um, that screen, that task interface is often only a tiny part of the wider project. So it's important to think about, to understand the scope of crowdsourcing projects as being um, quite involved. So one project that I've worked on is the British Libraries in the Spotlight project um, using a platform called Pybossa, which we modified extensively with Vue.js. It's engaged um, about 2,800 registered volunteers um, who've made over a quarter of a million contributions over time. We've completed hundreds of projects, which means that there are hundreds of volumes of, in our case, playbills that are now more discoverable. So this is the task interface, um, which shows an example of a historical playbill. Um, these are difficult to process computationally because the number, the quality of the image, um, the number of typefaces or typography on the image make it hard to transcribe automatically. Um, and the text is tricky in that the largest lines of text aren't necessarily the title of the performance. So it's, they're not structured in any reliable way. Um, you can also, you might notice some long S's which look like F's um, in this particular typeface. So uh, optical character recognition can't necessarily cope with this. Um, this task asks people to um, highlight the title of a performance and then in this case, give the genre and um, 
we're looking at genre not because it's something that we think people typically search for but because it responds to research questions about the licensing of theater performances and particularly the relationship between um theaters in london and theaters outside of london and um the dramatic performances and how people called other kinds of performances non-dramatic performances so it responds to a metadata need to generate information about texts and dates but also a research question and this screen shows some of the ways in which some of the task is about being productive so transcribe the genre and enter it but you can also add a note and we get quite a few notes from people that highlight something interesting you can download or share the image um, you can like it, you can go back and view the full metadata, you can view the image in the context of the full volume of historical playbills in the British Library's catalogue, you can download the data, you can discuss it. So this mix between productivity and engagement is um, really evident on this page where some of what we're asking people to do is just transcribe text, but we're also putting distractions in their way. We want them to be engaged and to think and to share their ideas about these historical collections. Um, and we see some of this playing out in the discourse on social media or in the forums where people notice things. Some people bring their own expertise to the process. Um, sometimes people have more expertise in particular aspects than we do, obviously, as um, increasingly institutions have fewer subject specialists. Um, so we get these great discussions happening sometimes. Um, at the moment, we're completely out of um, volumes because with the lockdowns, people completed our volumes really quickly. But you see these discussions where people use a range of different sources to talk about our collections. And it's a really lovely way of putting our collections in a wider context um, as they were sort of thought of as the time at the time. And another project I wanted to discuss briefly is Living with Machines. Um, which will be very familiar to Giovanni as one of the original co-investigators. This project is applying data science methods to digital history questions at scale, using in part the digitized newspapers from the British Library's collection. So we're looking at millions of pages of newspapers. And one of the tasks that we wanted to do was ask people to um, look for the phrase this machine or the machine in um, historical newspaper articles because the, um, our sense now of what a machine is, is different than it was in the 19th century. And we're looking at the impact of mechanization on ordinary lives. So to understand that we need to think about what did mechanization mean? What did people think of as being a machine? So it might be a bicycle, for example, which we don't think of as a machine now, but they did then. And what does that tell us about how they understood things? So in this case, we have taken historical images, looked for the phrase, this machine highlighted that, um, on the page and then asked questions about it. And at the moment, we're in the process of analyzing this data. And we think there are some possibly interesting findings in terms of um, when, when descriptions of machines were more detailed or less detailed. Um, these are often ads, which is a kind of interesting wrinkle in terms of the um, what's available in historical data sets about identifying ads reliably, where well, we can't exclude them from the set. Um, so we might do another task where we ask people to simply say, is this an ad or is it a journalistic article of some kind? So what do we get from this kind of process? Well, we get data, um, they might be observations, um, we get knowledge for the public and from the public, we get increased skills for um, people working in institutions, we get just plain um, publications and data sets and hopefully also um, a greater and more engaged use of cultural heritage collections and knowledge. Sometimes we get more diverse perspectives and hopefully we always get new relationships or deeper relationships between participants, project teams and institutions. And just to briefly touch on the challenges, some are quite common in that you need time and resources to manage this. You also need to think about it in the right way. Um, data and workflow management is the sort of secret source that keeps things going. Sometimes there's uh, fear about the credibility of public observations and it's always um, difficult to reach people because there are so many crowdsourcing projects now. Increasingly, we're thinking about integrating crowdsourcing into research processes. So how do you integrate data science timelines, um, which are much faster than museum or library timelines and crowdsourcing sort of fits in the middle somewhere. 
How do we integrate those into a wider process? How do we integrate machine learning into crowdsourcing while still enabling these really vital touch points that of access and curiosity? And how do we ensure that these human computation systems have appropriate cultural heritage values? So we're not just thinking of people as workers, but we're thinking of them as volunteers with their own expertise and their own knowledge. Um, so these um, are the kinds of activities that we'll look at in the broader masterclass, um, helping you really get a sense of what's involved and how you could do your own project or how you can critically assess projects. Um, so just finally, I wanted to share a call to action where you can help affect the success of a project. Um, we've just released a book called The Collective Wisdom Handbook, um, which was written collaboratively over March and April and really drawing on um, uh, 16 co-contributors skills and knowledge developed over the last couple of decades. We've opened this up for comments and review. So we'd love to see your questions and your highlights um, and think about how you might use this. And if you wanna get a sense of what's involved in crowdsourcing ahead of the masterclass, this is obviously a great place to go, we hope. Um, and also the Libra group is um, doing a citizen science guide. So if you have expertise in open data or infrastructure, they'd love to hear from you. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over. Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. Great, uh, great presentation. If I can get a round of applause for, for you. <laughs> really, really interesting. And uh, again, as a reminder, if you scroll up uh, just a few messages in the chat, you can find the tweet with all links and information that Mia was uh, uh, proactive enough to share before the presentation. So that's, that's great. Uh, before we go to to Stefania, uh, I, I already see questions in the in the chat, so uh, I would like to encourage everybody really to uh, to think about them and already share them, and we will pick them up during the second part of the of the session. Stefania, would you like to go up next, please? I think you're muted. Sorry. Yes, I've clicked on share sound and optimize for video clips. So I hope it, Let's give it a try. it's going to work now. now uh, to start your audio. Um, let's see. Where is that? It is. Yeah, present. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So um, this is the furnace uh, where the new campus has been built of the Belleval University of Luxembourg. And um, here you have the C2DH, Center for uh, Contemporary and Digital History, of which I've been part for five years. My, my, um, I say my contract is terminating within a few uh, weeks. And I've had the privilege of um, creating a teaching resource. Um, it's a platform. Uh, with lessons to teach students or whoever uh, how to apply source criticism to digitized and digital born sources. Um, it is uh, one of the principles of that of that platform is that I, I wanted direct access so no account no downloading, it's just there and anyone can access it and do whatever he or she wants to do with it. Um, this, is, this was the goal of it, but I gradually um, became con conscious of the fact that there were another additional needs to be able to talk about this topic. And these are needs that probably many of you will know how does my computer work, how the web, XML, what is a search engine, what is reliable information. No, you cannot copy everything you like from the web. And so 
with the source criticism, which is a kind of specific um, element of um, the si discipline of history, it became clear that I could only engage with this part of the teaching if I would also provide information and very accessible information, not only for the students, but also for the lecturers. Because one of the problems was that if I put together lessons about how to use tools and how to reflect on tools to my audience, which is an already digitally educated audience, then I'm preaching to the converted. So what I try to do, and this took quite a lot of time to think of it, is to create something that is, that is, is kind of very open, low threshold, and can be perceived and used and reused uh, by a lecturer and students, because it is so easy, because you can get various levels of, of complexity. And um, I see myself, if I think of the, 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 the overall message of this masterclass, I see myself as an expert in digital pedagogy. And the people I would have to relate to with my message is educators, lecturers, librarians, an archivist and curator, and the, the topics, the subjects that are taught at university would be research methodology and historiography. So this is where I see that I can, this, the, the, the platform kind of can bridge the difference and the gap that there is between traditional history, which is which is huge, which is still massive, and the digital that, and I've been in, in the digital hub for five years, but with one lag, lag in the traditional history. And there I can see that there is still so much work to do. And, um, and actually, in a way, I, I, I can say that the platform, which I will show you here, is a kind of digital light, I would call it, because it, it's, it's not, you don't download tools and data to process it and to um, exercise with optical character recognition, but you're taken by the hand. I'll just give you one example of one of these lessons. So here you have an explanation. You, you have a short clip of uh, five minutes, then the same clip with a quiz created with it. And this takes about 20 minutes and can be viewed and by anybody. It's, it's just very low threshold to get uh, to grips to the, the key problem of a digitized source and how this works out in research and in the general public. And then you have the medium, this is the small, and this is the medium uh, module. And this has a whole set of assignments that you have here with, with clicks. So Murbridge, how was Murbridge before digitization? How, how, did it, how did it evolve? How was it multiplied, multiplicated before the digitization? And how come it's online now in YouTube? And what is the difference between what you see on YouTube and how it was created in the first place. And this is how we, we kind of engage with the material. And each lesson has an, an, an answer template, which you can download. And here we have a whole series of teaching aids. And one of the most um, handy one is this one, which is a kind of overview of questions to ask to a digitized source. So you have a context of creation, context of preservation, and a context of digital representation. And of course, you can ask the same questions to the digital born source, but here you have, a, you have technology come in. So here we, we also explain uh, how a manuscript what the technologies are for digitization and the challenge that 
a lecturer or teacher would have is to, to take other examples from the, the student's own private life or, or whatever, and then reflect on these elements, what, what changes when you change it to digital? What is the, you know, meta reality, sense, sound? And this is an example which you can, can apply to a lot of sources. And so here we take a few and we ex explain how it is created electronically, digitally. So these are the teaching aids. And then for each lesson, you have specific teaching aid. And one that will be very useful, I think, for a lot of researchers in web archives is we, together with the assistant, we have created um, a tutorial kind of tutorial on how the, the, we have explained the whole interface of the internet archive. So if you go here, you know every field is explained, what you must do, uh, how you can repeat the process so that you really understand how the whole internet archive works. So this is, um, it was quite hard to, to actually to, uh, to find, an, it's strange to say, but it was hard to find an audience for this platform. Not because the content is not attractive, but because, um, I encountered the curriculum, at least at, at my university, but also at other universities, as a kind of fortress, in the sense that there is a pedagogical um, principle that a professional should be able to collect and create his or her own teaching material. So the idea that you take something, a kind of cash and carry that is ready, and integrate a great part of it in your teaching as, as seen, as perceived, I've interviewed a lot of people as, yes, but I might take a, a small element, but not a whole lesson. And I, I have to think of assignments myself. So I had the problem there in really integrating uh, and making it, making it, it um, usable in, in the context of teaching. So that was quite a, and then, uh, I have had a strategy to, to change this. And this was this lesson, the web as historical source, because we have a professor at Luxembourg University, Valerie Schaefer, and her speciality is web archives. So when you have a specialist who has an engagement with a topic and teaches about the topic and explains things about the topic, and you have such a person have time to collaborate with you, then you can create a lesson and all the context, which is completely geared towards the experiences of that expert in teaching and in research. And then you know, I have users. So I, I created, this is a lot of this, these lessons I created with people, but one that I created myself is about David Boulder and, uh, he was the very first person to record uh, survivor testimonies in the summer of 1946. And it's a beautiful lesson, but I, I can't find a user. <laughs> or maybe there is a user, but he, he or she is out there and I don't know the person. So um, I'm, I'm, of course, also making publicity to use all this material. Um, and... I had one more thing to say about the, the, the role, the, the, let's see if I can go back to my slide. Yes, yes. To present. Yes, this was the one that I would like to share with you.
Yes. The critical, what I see, and maybe this is, I don't know whether this is, this is uh, already, um, we are a step ahead now, but in general, when I look at the traditional historical community, I see an under exploitation of many of the available digital cultural heritage resources. And when I see projects that are in the making, um, I think it's very important to customize to the expectations, the needs and the context of an existing user group that wants to engage with it for a long time and that follows the development of the project. Because then it's not only yours, but it's also theirs. And then you can, you can create a community. So um, this, this kind of connects to what Mia was saying. Uh, you have to have a pleasant experience. And besides the curriculum is a fortress, another big challenge is, is the lack of time of researchers and lecturers to make use of the, the, the plethora of incredible resources that are there. What I see very often at, at conferences is that you get a tremendous amount of input about new opportunities, and then you your and then you go back to work to your university, and there is such a pressure of things that have to be done that you never, never, ever come to the point of actually going through what you see in the conference and using it. And so I, that's why I think that things like a masterclass are really a very good opportunity to really have time to share insights and and see whether you can build on top of each other instead of having your own project which is um so the the i would very much be in favor in the further development of of cultural heritage project and this digitization project to include a, a guarantee for reception and engagement of the audience, because it's kind of, it's a development that is very fertile in the academic environment, but academics are not very good at marketing. <laughs> and, and maybe they should take up because they are involved in creating stuff and spreading it, but it's very hard to get people because you, you need resources, you need time, you need, and that, takes up a lot of uh, a lot of energy and it is not um, it's not the criterion that you're judged by if you want to be an academic so I think I filled my time <laughs> I, I wanted to show you our last clip um, the latest clip which is on um, social media and uh, historians, the relation between historians and social media. No, it's not a historical source. Yes, it is, and we should preserve it. Well, we've made a very short clip of four and a half minutes, but I'll put the, the link in the chat and then you can see it for yourself and we can keep some time for, for questions and exchange. Super. Uh, Stefania, thank you so much. Please uh, all join me in, uh, in thanking, uh, okay. thanking Stefania for this presentation and very compelling points. And, uh, and also the illustration of what I think is, a, is an extremely valuable resource uh, with a lot of high quality teaching materials. I've also put the link in the chat um, should anyone would like to, to take a look. Couldn't agree more that we uh, we are very not uh, not very well coordinated in academia in terms of uh, sharing uh, high quality teaching resources. There is a lot of reinventing the wheel, and but this is also it's it's not about unwilling. It's we just don't have time. I think yeah. that time is the only parameter to do better. Yeah, indeed, there is a lot of pressure and, and many reasons for that. But uh, I just wanted to underline that I, I really agree with your point. And also, this is something that I, I create. And I think also at the European we are uh, we are very eager to contribute to. 
so thank you again for for making that point, and I'm sure we will have a discussion about it in a in a moment. Um, and then uh, next, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, I would like to ask Ariana and uh, James to please share their presentation. All right, thank you. Um, share my screen. Okay, so we're a double act. Um, I'll do the first half and Aaron will do the second half. Um, so we're going to view um, this topic of organising and mentoring effective multidisciplinary research groups through the lens of KDL, which is a, now it's worth noting that it's a very specific site, specific lab with particular characteristics. Um, I was involved in um, the early, early days of setting up a lab in New Zealand that was very different. Um, so this is, you know, for any masterclass, we would emphasize that this is a model, but definitely not the model. There are, there are aspects of KDL that you, you might want to apply to, to a different lab, um, but it's, it has particular characteristics. Um, so I'll provide some overview, and this is how we'd run a masterclass. Um, I'll provide over, an overview about the socio-technical context because the, the, I guess the, the, the high, the high level um, sort of context for, for any lab needs to be socio-technical. So Ariana will talk about the research software engineering, which is where the rubber hits the road really in terms of um, software development, research software development, obviously. But our philosophy is that unless you understand it in a socio-technical context and put a framework in place, enabling an enabling framework in place, it won't work um, um, effectively or optimally, but it also won't scale and won't necessarily be a good place to work. And one of the reasons I'm really interested in the socio-technical context is because there aren't that many labs out there, DH labs, let's face it, that have stood the test of time. And, and my assumption is, or my guess is, that they're, they're focused on wires and boxes and servers um, rather than, than trying to design and dock a, um, a lab within its socio-technical context. So KDL has been operational since 2015. Um, I view it as an experiment. It's a work in progress. I don't think we've found the right framework and until we've been in existence for 20 years, I don't think we will have proved this framework. So take it for what it is. Um, we have 13 staff, research software uh, lab and project managers, software analysts like Ariana, software engineers, UI UX designers, systems manager, and we also have research affiliates, various postdoc fellows. Um, the, the distinguishing aspect of King's Digital Lab in terms of research software engineering is our division of labor. There aren't that many teams who will have designers as well as engineers. Um, the Jack or Jane of all trades kind of engineer has been the standard model. Um, and that suits again our context but might not suit every context we have quite significant um digital infrastructure for a dh team not not really as tiny in research software engineering terms but quite significant for a dh team um, we run virtual servers we have about manage about 200 virtual machines um, close to a terabyte of ram um, we manage about 160 digital projects. We inherited 100 when we started in 2015, which brings its own issues. Um, get about 50 million web hits a year across our different projects, and we manage about 5 million digital objects. So for a, a software engineering team that's embedded within a faculty, it's, um, you know, it's reasonably significant. We're supported by external funding and underwritten um, internally with um, you know, the, uh, our primary model is to um, have um, cost recovery of, of our costs. We aim for 70%, and that basically means we just, we try and, we're involved in lots of bids. Um, 
So we, are, we, we sit within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Um, we like to see ourselves as un, underpinning our whole faculty and um, we exist to enhance digital capability across all departments. We have a special relationship with the Department of Digital Humanities because we evolved out of, out of DH. Now this is um, approaching the, what, the way that we um, think about our socio-technical context. So these are the, um, as my current line manager refers to it, sort of our API <laughs> that we interact with, with groups within our institution. Um, we interact with our faculty, we have a close relationship with our arts cluster administrative office, but we also have um, close relationships with finance and faculty and finance at college level. Um, we have a close relationship with our new college e-research um, initiative. I'm Deputy Director of e-research. So we sort of view our, our, our socio-technical context in concentric circles in some ways. Um, and this is the framework that enables the research software engineering that Ariana speaks about. And I guess the question for any masterclass, and it is a moot point, is do you need this? Do you need to define a lab in this way as a how do you right size your socio-technical design and context for a lab to ensure that you have flexibility as well as um, longevity? And there's all, obviously also the national and, and global context. So after going sort of outlining that the framework that we've implemented and we think is appropriate for our lab, we would explore um, these other challenges that, that this sort of socio-technical context implies. Now, how do you define a space that interfaces effectively and responsibly with your local institution while providing a pre protected space for creativity? So how do you accept the fact that you work within a corporate university but still want to be creative? It's a, there's a pragmatic aspect there. How do you build a collective team culture while respecting individual and natural power dynamics, both within engineering teams and across to humanities and external collaborators. How do you define new career paths and roles, which, which we really focused on, and foster talent pipelines to nurture those, those career paths? Um, how do you enable cultural diversity and decolonizing aspects to research software engineering, which comes freighted with, with a bunch of, of cultural um, and operational baggage? How do you balance the need for technical and financial sustainability with creativity and agility? That framework is sort of procrastian in a way, um, and there's pros and cons with it. How do you secure technical assets and integrate with institutional IT, um, while also enabling use of heterogeneous open source technologies? It's a, a, we need to square that circle, and it's a, it's a challenging problem. Um, and I suppose, in a way, most importantly for me anyway, how do you balance um, institutional and external community missions? We're very inward focus, focused in some ways in KDL, but we want to share with the community. So over to Ariana for the research software engineering context. Thanks, James. Um, so I can speak a little bit more about, um, as uh, James said, the, uh, the, the inside uh, of the lab operational method in particular with respect to the research software engineering um, context. So the first um, important aspect related to the process of how we work is the discussion of the software development life cycle. The, the slide that I see, James, is empty. Could you click on it so we can see the actual, yes. Um, and the, the, the idea of the masterclass would be to share with participants how um, within KDL we adapted the mainly the Agile DSDM uh, methodologies to our software development life cycle, but also how we shaped it and, and change it um, within a research context. Um, so example will range from um, the way that we, we, um, we go through the path of a project from its pre-project stage, so early conceptual development, all the way to for example, funding application, requirement assessments and elicitation to, um, to the actual evolutionary development phase, um, which is the, where the core action within the, um, the research software engineering team happens. 
um, and then all the way to the release and post project, which as we know within a research context is, is still very relevant and, and important. Um, so ideally in the masterclass, we will look at not only examples of our own project, but also share some of our um, practices. And in particular, I'm gonna share the link on the chat. And um, in particular, the way we, um, as I said before, kind of keeping as reference the Agile DSDM methods, we shaped our, if you like, governance documents, which are really project templates that help us um, structure a project. And I guess in relation with the other um, sessions and presentations, the focus on process is very important here. Mia mentioned, for example, all the efforts that go into um, producing a, an interface that is usable for external users. Similarly, in a lot of our project, what um, the public might see, it's a, only just the tip of the iceberg. So the idea of this masterclass is to actually dwell more on what's under the iceberg and, and the process that go into shaping the research direction of a project, the context, uh, the technical methods, and how this is done within a, um, within a multidisciplinary team, because obviously the team, the project team includes not only the research software engineers, which in themselves are very different in terms of expertise, but also project partners, research assistants, uh, professional service, administrators, and so on. Um, can you go into the next slide, please, James? Um, we will also uh, will also aim to, um, in a way, uh, discuss some of the elements of the um, how the software development lifecycle interact with larger methods that are um, obviously looking at the overall picture of the lab. So some some someone would, well, we, we um, try to conceptualize those as monitor methods for the lab. And this is because in a way that wider structure is indeed possibly talks more to other contexts as well. So this slide here showcases an example of how we structured those monitor methods. Um, starting from, for example, the daily stand up within the team where we share how our day is gonna be organized, what kind of project we're gonna focus on that day, what obstacles or what issues we have, how we like help from other colleagues to the uh, weekly pipeline planning for, for project and any issues, any contact that we receive from the external world uh, to fortnightly time box meetings that allow us to, to structure the work into sprints, typically of two weeks time. The monthly team meetings, we had one today, for example, that are more focused on, for example, HR issues or well-being. Um, and then there should be one last uh, square, James, if you press one more time. Uh, the quarterly time boxing meetings, which give us um, a sense of projection and estimates beyond, ideally within a quarter of the year, so three months projections. And as, as James said before, obviously this is a model, so it's, it's the, what we found optimal for our way of working, and in fact is in constant review um, and improvement. But the idea of the masterclass would be indeed to discuss some elements of our model and critique it and possibly have from the participants ideas of their own context and how they could benefit from the discussion with us in defining their own model or improving their own model. Um, and next slide, please, James. So um, by presenting our model, then what are the challenges that we will aim to explore, especially from the point of view of the research software engineering context? Uh, well, first of all, how to foster a culture of research within an engineering team. Um, so for us, that term research, software engineering is very important, but it brings with it obviously um, challenges from what I said, for example, about adapting industry standards with respect to project management or, or um, design building methods um, to other areas, for example, training and, and how much space to give to um, outreach, dissemination, um, the production of research outputs and so on. Um, another important element how, in a challenge, how to form teams, design project and define concept across heterogeneous teams. So I hinted before at the fact that not only our team is diverse in itself, but it interacts on a daily basis with very different roles from, for example, uh, information technology department at the university level or providers of the vendors of different kind to contractors, um, to partners in cultural heritage institutions, to other universities and so on. And this is, um, it can be unpacked at different levels of the, of the project life cycles. 
A third, third challenge, how to approach radical cross-disciplinary communication, again, engineering versus research. And here there are all sorts of questions um, and challenges to face, including ethical ones, if you like, um, that in intersect also with the with the roles and the status of the roles and the HR issues and, and also issues of labor that I think um, uh, James um, also highlighted in the first part of the talk. So again, the, the two contexts are obviously related. Um, how to support a spectrum of talent ranging from engineer to postdocs, academic staff and professional service personnel. Um, now again, within KDL and within some of the project life cycles, I think we, should be um, happy about how we manage to, for example, involve early career and how then their, their careers develop. But there are challenges associated to some of this, uh, these paths and, and some of the, the way in which the research, the research software engineering career paths um, crisscross with, with other type of careers in, within the academic spectrum and beyond in the professional sectors as well. So it'd be interesting to share some of the challenges we faced and we face with um, other experiences. And then last but not least, how to manage the tension between budgetary reality and creative aspiration. And if you like, that's again, is related to the first point as well about the focus on um, delivering products that are high quality and on time and on budget following best practices, but at the same time, leaving space for innovation, exploration, experimentation, creativity, um, and so on. And it's really a matter of square in the circle. So there is no one solution, um, but there are ways in which we think we try to carve that space uh, and to make sure that while we, because of the, the, the scale of project we manage. So while we try to create a certain um, uh, robustness, if you like, in our process, but so that we could actually carve that time and that space is also for experiments. Um, yes, I think that's it. And um, yeah, we will be keen also to see what the participants will bring in terms of their own experiences. I think the, the masterclass will be shaped a lot also by, by what comes in from the audience. I think this is it from me. There's the last slide is just a thank you, I think. Okay. Excellent, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, let me ask for a round of applause for you as well, Jamie and Arena. Um, I mean, you really have a model there for the for research engineering, at least in my opinion, in, in digital humanities. So it's so important, and uh, and uh, you're really a reference in the community. So uh, it's great to have you uh, for the master, this master class. Um, so I think I have personally quite a few questions, and uh, I also think the audience might uh, might as well. Uh, but before then, I think we might use a, a short break, uh, and then we can get going. So I would suggest to take until twenty past, very short break, and then to jump into a panel and uh, discussion. Um, yeah, and please type your questions in the chat or raise your hand, and then we will start ACP from from those. See you soon.